Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, dear colleagues, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andris Sprutz. I'm director of Latvian Institute of International Affairs. Uh, for me, it's a great pleasure to welcome you uh, in, in a pre-holiday season, one of the last pre-holiday discussions on Latvian connectivity. Uh, very important, I think, very timely, always timely, timely top topic, timely subject. Uh, um, Latvia has been dubbed as a gateway, as a bridge, as a hub uh, in, in last decades and last centuries. So I think we have served this role to be a connectivity hub in the region. Uh, we are also discussing right now how to proceed, how to use up our opportunities of geographical location. But it's not only about us, it's also about wider developments, not only national developments, not only national decisions, but also what happens in the region, what are the regional dynamics, and also what are the global dynamics. And that's why I think this debate is including all those three dimensions, national dimension, regional dimension, more global dimension. Uh, if we speak about global dimension, I think it is very important to discuss uh, Chinese initiatives, Belt and Road Initiative especially. Uh, and uh, I think it is really the grand design, a grand strategy. Many would say it's a win-win strategy for everyone uh, involved as a transcontinental uh, transportation, connectivity, people-to-people -people, uh, connectivity as well. So actually I'm saying already there are a number of connectivity ways, not only infrastructure and transport, but also the people-to-people, -people, more software cooperation as well. So I think there are a number of dimensions, and this provides, of course, a lot of opportunities. It provides a lot of challenges. It provides a lot of tasks what we should do, accomplish, again, nationally and regionally. And I think this debate is, uh, I hope this debate will help us also to discover some of those directions, some of those dimensions, some of those opportunities, and also we identify some of the challenges. Uh, I would uh, say thanks to all our partners, especially Latvian Railways, for being a uh, being a good partner in, 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 in promoting these debates, and of course also our experts who, who, who were um, willing to join us and to contribute with their insights. And with this, I uh, am uh, giving the floor to the uh, Dr. Runa Alexandra Berznia Cherenkova, uh, who is the uh, head of the New Silk Road program at the Latvian Institute of International Affairs. So she's been our uh, top, uh, top person on exactly everything what goes to East, but not only. So today you will also connect the East and the West, the Asia and Europe, so because it's transcontinental connectivity. Uh, so I, of course, um, uh, wish a lively debate. Anuna, the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, dear experts, um, today uh, we are trying to put together two very important discourses that we have in Latvia. The first is us as a member of the Nordic, uh, Northern Europe, and our role and our responsibilities within it. And the second is our role uh, in deepening transregional, transcontinental connectivity and being a part also of the transcontinental initiatives, including Belt and Road. So today we are attempting, and we are sure that we will succeed, to put these two conversations into one. Therefore, we have invited, just like Professor Sprude said, speakers who will give you their view on the opportunities, on the risks, and maybe give you something to think about in the future. Each speaker will have 10 minutes, and after that, the floor will be open to questions. So you are very much welcome to put your questions down. You will have your turn. Thank you. And first of all, I would like to present Dr. Tim Rudlik, our colleague from the Swedish Institute of International Affairs, who will give us a broader outlook on the Scandinavian Chinese connectivity. Please, Tim. Thanks a lot. Thanks, uh, first of all, for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here. My second time, I very much enjoy being in Riga. Well, very briefly, um, 10 minutes not, is that coming? Mm. Yeah, it is. Um, so I will try to, I'm, I should 
basically say that my background uh, is in uh, China studies. Uh, I'm more recently more and more engaged in Europe-China relations, um, and here I was asked to focus particularly on the role of Scandinavia, and when I speak of Scandinavia, I've heard that the Finnish ambassador is here. Uh, I'm, ah, yeah, uh, I will uh, focus on uh, Scandinavia in a more narrow sense, meaning Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, um, particularly since I guess I know a bit more about those uh, three countries living in uh, Sweden. Uh, I might focus a bit more on Sweden, if you don't mind. Uh, very briefly, I mean, you probably know the maps, you know the activities um, along the Belt and Road and what it implies and uh, its enormous uh, economic and geographical scope. But let me uh, say two sentences about it. First, I think uh, we tend to think of the Belt and Road Initiative uh, either as a huge opportunity uh, and or that's often mixed with each other and you will see that's also the case in Scandinavia or as a potential threat or even a threat seeing that connectivity interconnectedness that we used to think is just in terms of facilitating uh, globalization, facilitating um, common prosperity though to different extents and not everyone around the world is obviously profiting from it the same way but we haven't really thought of interconnectedness for a long time in geopolitical terms and political terms on how to control uh, uh, countries regions etc and if you see uh, after a while such a map uh, then it's quite obvious that people in Europe and beyond sometimes think of that as a threat, as something that is changing sort of the game, how we perceive globalization. At the same time, I think what we really overlook in this is that a lot uh, behind the rationale, uh, the reason why China has initi initiated the Belt and Road in the first place, a lot of this is actually domestic. This might be something that we can discuss later on. I'll skip it since I should focus on Scandinavia, but I think it's worth mentioning here. Um, so, as I just said, the EU sort of, um, let me put first into the perspective of the EU, I think the EU is turning more and more both pr pragmatic and critical on China at the same time. We'll see a bit the same in, in Scandinavia as well here. But uh, let me remind you that uh, the European External Action Service just this year has uh, released a new strategic outlook, as they call it, uh, where they term China to be a partner, a competitor, as well as a systemic rival. And these three terms are quite different, which uh, is an attempt, I think, to sort of differentiate uh, between different policy fields, between different uh, areas in which we either compete, uh, uh, corporate, or even rival. And I think there's four main aspects in, uh, uh, in the debate here in the EU, and the, these four aspects do play a great role in Scandinavia as well. First is, I think, given what you've just seen on the map, there is a uh, clear sense that we should and we need to cooperate and profit uh, from China's growing economic uh, cloud and its investments throughout. That brings already to the second point, that is particularly investments. There are a number of European countries that face severe investment gaps here that China can help fill in. But at the same time, you have the discussion about the lack of a, a level playing field. So there's lots of concern that while China, China finds it quite easy to invest in Europe, Europe finds it sometimes quite hard to invest in China. The third aspect is, I think, uh, the authoritarian uh, uh, regime in uh, China, the tightening grip of control, particularly under Xi Jinping, that rises skepticism across Europe. Uh, and that rises it more the more you cooperate. And finally, I think um, it's the question, uh, being in a country that's member of it, the, this uh, 16 or now 17 plus one format uh, has um, sparked also a debate whether that's a sign of increased importance of European, of, of Europe, getting sort of more voice, getting more say, shaping Chinese affairs, or whether that's a divide and rule strategy. Obviously, we have very different perspectives from member states, and I'll focus a bit on the discussions in the three Scandinavian countries in a narrow sense. And if you look in the same map that I just showed you, but on the map in Europe, you will see, well, there's quite some economic activity 
But if we look at the Nordic countries, uh, you see there's not much, if not nothing. Um, at the same time, you also see that the ones that are white, the, the uh, countries that are white, they have sent uh, heads of state or and government to the last Belt and Road Forum in Beijing. And there you can see it's also particularly the South and the Southeast who has done so. So is there a widespread skepticism? Well, yes and no in Scandinavia. I think for one, and now I go quickly through the four criteria I just mentioned. Um, so yes, also in, in Scandinavia we have a strong sense that uh, we should uh, engage with China and should profit from increased connectivity. Even though there's no Belt and Road initiatives in the narrow sense in Scandinavia, Scandinavia can still profit from, from uh, increased trade that will also ultimately end up uh, in Scandinavian countries. And if you look um, that uh, uh, on this table, there's a uh, selection of European countries and you will see uh, Sweden is quite, quite high up in its reliance on exports with China. 4.8% of uh, exp uh, Swedish exports go to China. Um, and you see that Denmark uh, and Norway have less, so it's on different, uh, on different scale. But the Swedish example shows you also over time that uh, it's constantly increasing. Secondly, if you look... Um, at investments, uh, you find quite different stories in the three uh, Scandinavian countries. In Norway, uh, I think it's fair to say that you see a rational but very low-key approach at the same time. So you have a bunch of projects, uh, infrastructure projects that China has been investing in that uh, loom quite large uh, locally, for example, a bridge not far from Norwich, or a discussion currently going on uh, on a port that is very close to uh, the Finnish and Russian border. Um, you have uh, in the northern N Norwegian region also some discussion whether it could be a chance uh, to have an Arctic corridor uh, in the Belt and Road Initiative. But um, you also have quite significant concerns in terms of environmental protection and economic sustainability. So which projects are actually feasible economically. In Denmark, you have much fewer sums than in the other two Scandinavian countries, but interestingly, more projects, so quite a lot of small-scale Chinese investments. And Denmark is really trying to come up with a coordinated approach, but still remains lo rather low-key at the moment. And Sweden, at the end, receives certainly most investments of the three, uh, but uh, with the rise of investments, rise also concerns. You can see clear securitization, clear, a clear rise of security concerns over, over Chinese investment that relates to a port close to Gothenburg. It relates to uh, high-speed rail links both connecting Stockholm with uh, Gothenburg but also with Oslo. Um, you can see uh, in this chart down that uh, uh, investments in um, Sweden are rising, but you can also see on the right-hand side that most of that, more than 70%, actually attributes to automotives, which is essentially Volvo. So it's not much in connectivity so as such. Finally, uh, no, the thirdly uh, is the political rivalry, what is sort of the political dimension. Here we see a number of aspects happening in Sweden, and here I think it is really backfiring on China. I don't know whether you've followed all this and how much time I have left to go into that, but maybe this, it's also an uh, aspect for the discussion. But there's a bunch of cases. Gui Minhai, a Swedish citizen, being held in custody uh, in China. There has been an incident where China is accusing uh, uh, Swedish police of having abused uh, tourists in, in Stockholm. Uh, there's a Swedish TV show that has been uh, broadcasting. It's a sort of uh, a comedy show that has uh, had racist accusations against uh, Chinese tourists. There's, the ch and there's a Chinese ambassador that is actively uh, trying to sort of uh, engage with the uh, Swedish public, but not always in a very constructive way since he's sort of correcting uh, s uh, all aspects that are very much backfiring at the moment in the Swedish discussion, because all of those fear aspects are very present. Uh, in the last weeks, I, I would really say. In Norway, you have quite a different uh, story here. Uh, you know probably that in 2010, the Nobel Peace Prize was uh, awarded to a 
Chinese uh, opposition dissident uh, Liu Xiaobo, uh, and it, it led to a freeze of uh, Norwegian-Chinese uh, relations for six years, and they're now recovering, so it's very low key. Uh, it's trying, uh, we see a normalization process here, but at the same time, we also see that Norway is very much looking towards its European and US partners in terms of security concerns and trying to follow them, for example, on Huawei. Uh, and finally, Denmark has, um, has already adopted such a low-key approach and has suffered a bit from uh, similar, uh, what I would call, punishments from, from China after a bunch of incidents lo less in scope uh, than the Leo Xiaobo case, but um, uh, you see also sort of some skepticism here uh, in terms of uh, economic cooperation. And finally, um, the question of a regional governance platform, and I think there I can be very brief. I think uh, it is very unlikely that we see will see a Nordic version of any something like 17 plus 1, neither in the context of the Nordic Council, nor in the context of the Arctic Council, nor anything new that is invented. But I should also say, not just due to the relatively low interest from, from uh, Scandinavian countries, but I think also from a uh, quite low interest from China's side in, in something like this. That has been more present a few years ago, but I think that has largely uh, disappeared from the discussion. So in conclusion, um, I think what we can see quite similar to Europe is uh, here that Scandinavia is taking at the same time a pragmatic and a critical turn. It's quite concerned about lot of lots of uh, aspects, but it's also seeing opportunities here. In, if you put it into the European, in com European comparison, I think uh, that Scandinavia is rather critical, uh, rather promoting a principled approach uh, that counts less on economic cooperation here. Um, you can see, uh, and, and if I should give any advice, I think that China should sort of try more actively to address those uh, security and environmental concerns that are raised in Scandinavia. On the Scandinavian side, I would say, well, it's also time to better understand, like to engage in a serious discussion about the rationale behind China's Belt and Road. Is it really about geoeconomics? Maybe in part it is, but to a large extent, as I indicated in the very beginning, I think it's not. Um, we should also see the opportunities, and I think um, that's something I had not the time to dig into, but maybe that's also something for the discussion. I think that Europe has quite some leverage to shape uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, after all, China keeps emphasizing that this should, that is co-shaped by China and its partners to rewrite that. That might be uh, not 100% the case, but indeed I think that Europe has a lot of opportunities also to shape the Belt and Road um, more actively if it sort of acts in concert and has a clear plan and vision to do so. And that's it for the moment. Thank you. Um, and I would like to present Mr. Edgar Suna, who is the deputy CEO of the Freeport of Riga, to speak for the industry. Uh, due to a technical issue, uh, we would like to show a slide, but we would have to pass the computer around. So please work with us. Uh, and Edgar, could you please begin with what is on the slide? Let's keep yeah. the others on the edge of their seats. Thank you, Una. Thank you very much for, um, for the invitation to this event. Uh, uh, on behalf of the organizers. Um, uh, to be honest, uh, I was um, kind of not preparing to, to make a presentation 10 minutes, but kind of understood it would be a, a roundtable discussion anyhow. I understand I have, a quite a, I have been charged now with a, a challenging task, basically for two reasons. We're talking about connectivity and building a land bridge between China and Sweden. And just now we heard uh, an expert's opinion that basically Scandinavia is, is not very upbeat about this uh, for several reasons, for environmental concerns, for security matters, and so, uh, which is of course, uh, which are of course issues to be taken into account uh, because these are things that matter in the long run. For a second reason, I see my task as challenging because I have on behalf of the whole industry. This is kind of a material task, isn't it? Uh, but I stand here for Riga Freeport and 
I will try to do my best. Uh, I will improv, talk without much of visual aids, and tell you what, how we see this and why we see this important. So um, to begin with, uh, I would like to say that Latvian transport and transit industry and the parties involved in it, namely railways, ports, forwarders, uh, port service providers are now in a very challenging We are facing great changes, both if, uh, internal changes, changes of management uh, in policy makers, uh, ministries, associations, etc. But uh, more importantly, we are facing changes uh, that come from external sources uh, for um, macroeconomic and geopolitical, that have some macroeconomic and geopolitical context. Um, it is no secret that uh, we, when I say we, I mean Latvian port, transport and port sector, uh, we are now striving to keep alive in a very competitive uh, marketplace. The eastern shore of the Baltic is um, full of ports that Unfortunately, not all compete on, on um, equal terms. And um, transport strategy of our greatest neighbor that for a long time used to be our main customer is aimed at digressing some of these main cargo flows uh, that come in large amounts uh, from uh, Baltic States ports uh, to its own ports. To be... Um, more concrete, of course, we're talking about Russia, our um, largest neighbor and customer, and also rival at the same time. So um, if you look at the cargo throughput uh, in ports and also what's going on uh, in, in, in terms of uh, rail transportation, we see that the tendencies are not very promising for the future at least uh, as far as our current uh, operations are concerned. So the big question is, what is there ahead? What is there uh, in the future for us? What are the opportunities to grab on? And uh, therefore, I think it is good time, and we have been doing this already for quite many years, I think, with the help of Latvian Railways, uh, uh, also Ministry of Transport, and not only, I cannot mention each and every. Uh, there is for sure cooperation that needs to be established more uh, between Latvian transport sector and China. In fact, the Belt and Road Initiative is nothing new. Uh, it was put forward by Chinese government, I think, back in uh, 2012, so quite, quite many uh, years ago. But... Um, the visual that, that is being passed around, I think uh, some of you have seen it, is very interesting. I think that the future lies, um, ahead, what, what lies ahead is in the eyes of visionary leaders. And back in the year 2000, uh, China's prime minister at the time uh, uh, was uh, visiting Riga Freeport, and he by hand made an interesting drawing. At that time, we saw it, we smiled at it, and we said, okay, Thank you for your courtesy and, and really expressing some belief in Riga port. But um, the truth is that uh, 20 years have passed and we see that these things start to materialize. And uh, Belt and Road Initiative is a bright example to that. So, so that would be from the point of view of whole industry. I think that uh, we have to look for new opportunities uh, in view of the the present changes in the whole sector. Secondly, speaking as the representative of Latvia's largest port, the Riga port, I can say that uh, we have just now adopted new strategy uh, for the next 10 years. And um, within the strategy, increasing of um, cargo flows that are more containerized and trying to look for new markets uh, is part of what we will be trying to do. Riga has all preconditions for that, both from infrastructure point of view, existing terminals, as well as uh, free lines available for development and building up of um, um, logistics um, uh, infrastructure, warehousing infrastructure of regional sense. So again, 
Um, at the moment, we have um, a maritime connection between Riga, and not only, I, I mean Riga, but also Ventspils and Liepai ports have the same between Latvia and Scandinavian ports. So why not build a future strategy, at least to some extent, uh, on these assets that we have? Good railway connections with our uh, neighboring country, Russia, um, and if we extend it further to China, so cargo coming from China through Russia to Latvian ports, and then use the sea connectivity to Scandinavian countries, at least to, to some extent. Yeah, this could be my 10 cents for the introductory part. And um, it's always good to have maybe little, uh, maybe different uh, viewpoints uh, because that uh, creates further discussion. Um, I hope I more or less covered in, in five or seven minutes the topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edgar. So I think you have done what we really needed and we heard the industry, the voice of the industry here. And thank you everyone for demonstrating a real example of cooperation by passing the visual around. And now I would like to ask Professor Steinbuka um, to speak as an academic today, but with someone with, with an experience also of a politician. <laughs> thank you very much uh, to organizers for inviting me to this very impressive discussion. Uh, like um, uh, Edgar said, also have not prepared a formal presentation. I really enjoyed what you have done, and I'm ashamed that this time I will also speak uh, uh, without, uh, without a visual presentation. Now, uh, uh, I suppose to talk about uh, Latvian interests uh, and potential benefits in uh, um, increasing connectivity with, with China. Um, now, I would like to refer to our Minister of Foreign Affairs, who uh, relatively recently, after, uh, after participation in, in the um, now 17 plus 1 framework, uh, summit uh, told that for Latvia, the key words are uh, connectivity, uh, trade, innovation, and also people-to-people -people contact. Okay, um, and this is true because um, to, ah, and digitalization, of course. Um, if we look at uh, Latvian and generally the Baltic states' trade with China. Trade is negligible. It even doesn't make any sense to demonstrate figures because this data, they disappeared as compared even with Scandinavian trade balance. Uh, so, um, uh, but what is very important, uh, Latvia and generally Baltics are very small scale economies and we cannot uh, even imagine that we can export to China a lot of uh, goods and services. But what is important, it is is to think about quality of these uh, exports. Yeah, it shouldn't be just food or processed food production or some simple things like wood, but it should be more sophisticated uh, goods and services. And it seems to me this is a challenge for the Baltic state in general to offer to our partners something which uh, something unique and with high value added. Uh, now, uh, Latvia, of course, is also very interested in attracting investment uh, um, because, um, okay, it, it, now it, it can, it, economy is growing with a quite impressive speed, but uh, it's not forever, and now the speed is slowing down in the next couple of years. We cannot um, expect that because of global uh, demand changes and also other things yeah uh, we cannot expect that we can achieve rapid growth without uh, quality investment and um, well Latvia benefits of course from the European structural funds from the investeu uh, different financial instruments but the private investments could be higher and in my view, even 
there can be find synergy between investment plan for Europe, also called Juncker plan or InvestEU, and Belt and Road Initiative and Connectivity. Because in the beginning, I very uh, well remember then when uh, investment plan for Europe has been launched, European Commission even invited the Chinese private companies to participate in the to co-invest in different projects. After that, uh, I mean, it was in 2014. Now, it seems to me that this um, initial initiative has been forgotten in a way, but I think the initiative was actually very, very good. Uh, next thing, innovation. Uh, we can be proud in Latvia only w about one project, with investment project with China, and uh, namely this um, investment into life sciences, and this uh, Beijing uh, Genomics Institute really have invested a lot in the uh, digital project uh, related also to life sciences, but it is also a very good reflection of digitalization. Uh, so this is, in my view, quality investment. However, we have heard about threat, and here in Latvia, we also, I'm still participating in different debates about is it good, is it bad, and what are the risks. So, of course, we should think about uh, minimizing risk, if not preventing at all, but at least reducing the potential risk. And that's why strategic screening of any investment project, this should be must, not only for the European uh, Union in general, but also for uh, every member state. Uh, now, people-to-people uh, -people context. Uh, I'm working now at the university. The number of Chinese students has been increased in the recent year. Uh, yesterday, my Chinese student <laughs> successfully defended her master's diploma and even received the award from rector. So, and uh, as a matter of fact, interesting topic. The topic was economic consequences uh, of raising populism. So, with different things example from Europe and from the US. But okay, I'm teaching in the master program European Studies, but I mean, if we look at Stranding University, where are plenty of in international, including Chinese students, and also exchange of researchers, uh, I personally participate in different uh, conferences in China, and uh, people, uh, researchers from China is coming to our country. So this people-to-people -people contact is very important uh, because, uh, well, I will not uh, talk about all potential benefits of this. Uh, now, about formats. Uh, we have plenty of formats to improve our cooperation with China and improve connectivity. Um, uh, of course, Belt and Road Initiative 17 plus 1 uh, framework. But again, I would like to refer now to our current Prime Minister who addressed the European Parliament as the last speaker talking about the European future uh, um, recently. And he said that he would appreciate not just 17 plus 1 framework, but 28 plus 1 mm. framework where 28 is all European member states. And, you know, responding to this uh, divide and, uh, and rule uh, initiative and to what extent Latvia being part of this 17 plus 1 is playing in the interest of uh, the whole union, uh, if uh, the Euro uh, European member states would decide to really extend this cooperation and make this framework um, different, yeah, to being involved, uh, uh, all of them, I think we all would benefit because all potential risks, uh, contradictions, uh, threats, and so on, we would uh, be would be assessed in a different in a different scale in a different format so let's hope that um, as our prime minister said that in the european uh, council uh, there are positive turn toward potential you know p potential future future uh, agreement on such a format. However, no decision has been ma yet ma made, and we know that now we, are, uh, we have already the new parliament, and then the new commission, and the new council, and then we will see what will be the further consideration.
Now, talking about threats, I fully agree with what you said, and uh, I made also research, and some Scandinavian researcher and German researcher and the others, they uh, warn uh, the Baltic states about potential threats. Uh, uh, with, but I will not uh, talk about this because it's a special topic for a generally a special topic, and I don't have time. Uh, just to uh, conclude, I would like to uh, say that in terms of transport connectivity, you, you said already a lot about the ports but uh, and about the railway connection, but you referred to uh, railway connection with Russia. I would say that a potential rail Baltic uh, uh, project uh, when implemented, and this will have, in my view, very positive impetus to trade uh, and cargo trade uh, between uh, South Asia, uh, China, uh, and Europe. Because then Latvia would be more and seem attractive as a hub, you know, to connect uh, Asia with Europe, because it will be Helsinki, Riga, Tallinn, Vilnius, Poland, and so on, uh, to Portugal. Uh, and uh, the, you know, so uh, it seems to me that this project, uh, and Baiba can tell maybe more about this, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Hopefully that the progress, uh, the, uh, this project will uh, uh, successfully develop and give uh, another positive uh, impact on connectivity. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, uh, for putting this into, a, into perspective. And now it is my pleasure to invite our last speaker, that is uh, Mr. Sun Ying Lai, uh, the Chargé d'Affaires of the Embassy of China uh, to Latvia. Is it just the one project? Uh, yeah. Just the one? You, you were speaking about more projects, from what I know. Maybe. Please welcome. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Your Excellencies, uh, Professor Stimbuka, uh, Dr. Wuna, uh, Mr. Spirutz, um, Franz, Laptin. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Wuna to invite me for, to this um, uh, panel discussion. Um, today, I would like to focus on china Latvia cooperation. Uh, I would like to choose this perspective to see the possible role of Latvia in the context of transcontinental connectivity in the Scandinavian direction. Uh, as we know, the Baltic countries are important transportation hubs connecting the Scandinavian countries with the Silk Road. Uh, while Latvia lies at the heart of the three Baltic countries, which makes it the core of Baltic transportation hub. Recently, the Chinese and the Latvian uh, have made joint efforts to make the best uh, of Latvia's unique geographical advantages to share fruits of Belt and Road construction with the uh, Latvian people. Here I would like to share my idea in, in the following aspects. Uh, first, uh, Latvia might become one of the maybe regional e-commerce hub. China has formally upheld trade liberalization and continue to open its market, encourage imports and promote a balanced international trade. In recent years, China-Latvia trade has maintained a rapid growth. According to statistics uh, from Latvia, uh, the bilateral trade between China and Latvia increased by 11.5% in 2017 and 9.8% in 2018. However, Bilateral trade is still relatively small, <laughs> uh, and the bilateral trade imbalance between China and Latvia still remains. There are various reasons behind that, uh, such as the Chinese customers have not got uh, enough knowledge about the good quality of uh, Latvian products. We didn't know about the, uh, the very sophisticated goods, the, the, uh, the high value added goods, yet, um, and also the market size of Latvia limits its import and export capacity. In order to find a solution, uh, China and Latvia reached a consensus on construction of China-Latvia 
cross-border e-commerce hub. On April 12, uh, under the witness of uh, the leaders of the uh, 17 plus one leaders, um, uh, the China uh, uh, Ningbo municipality signed an MOU with LIA about uh, uh, a transporter e-commerce hub. Uh, on May 20th, the China Latvian e-commerce hub was officially launched. It has already been launched. A Relac paint produced by Riga Paint and the Varnish factory was shipped from Riga Freeport to Ningbo, China. The China Latvia e-commerce hub will be based in Latvia, covering uh, broader markets of Scandinavian countries, Central and uh, Eastern Europe, and Western Europe. I hope Latvia could use its excellent geographical advantage, fine ports, and services to take the leading role to integrate the multinational productivity resources in this region. Second, possible regional transportation and uh, logistics hub. In recent years, China and Latvia have made breakthroughs in cooperation um, both uh, land, sea, and air transportation. In land transportation from um, 2016 to 2018, five pilot freight trains between China and Riga were launched. In terms of maritime transportation in 2017, Costco Shipping Container Transport Company opened a Baltic branch line by a Riga freeport, which immensely cut the shipping time and cost between China and Latvia. In terms of air cargo, in 2018, Alibaba Group opened a cargo charter flight from China to Riga in cooperation with Riga Airport. In terms of a direct passengers' flight, China and Latvia have uh, made unremitting efforts, but the air companies believe that it is a premature decision to open direct flight due to the current traffic volume and the market needs to be further cultivated. We hope in the near future, as the number of Chinese tourists in Latvia increase, our Baltic will cooperate with Chinese airlines to open direct flights between China and Latvia. In addition, when it comes to transportation and logistics infrastructure construction, China has its expertise. China hopes to use its technology and experience to cooperate with the Latvian side and the Scandinavian partners in accordance with EU standards to boost the infrastructure construction and benefit people's livelihood in this region. Third, possible regional life science research hub. Latvia's high-tech industry is oriented towards international cooperation, and the biotechnology industry has become a national development priority. We are glad to see that China and Latvia are engaged in promising cooperation in this field. In November 2017, Wuhan National Bio-Industry Base Construction Management Office, BGI Technology, and Latvian Ministry of Economics signed a tri-party agreement to establish a genetic sequencing equipment, R&D and manufacturing center, and a life science innovation platform in Riga. After signing the agreement, BGI promptly started the construction of the life science and technology center project with a planned area of 2,000 square meters. I think, uh, according to my knowledge, uh, it will be officially uh, operated in the coming September or October. At the same time, the project also established a joint laboratory with the Latvian Biomedical Center to actively carry out genomics research projects and the localization of genomics personal training. The Nordic countries like Sweden and uh, Denmark, they have very strong expertise in, in this area. This project may be pro uh, will provide new opportunities for cooperation 
in the direction of innovation connectivity. Fourth, possible Latvia will be one of the 5G pilot trial countries. Latvia is vigorously promoting 5G communication network construction in terms of technical standards, the 5G concepts, and the technical indicators advocated by China have been incorporated into the 5G definition of the International Telecommunication Union. The key technologies proposed by the Chinese companies have become essential part in international standards. By May this year, Chinese companies accounted for more than 30% of the 5G standard essential patent statements. 5G will not only transform the internet world from two-dimensional to three-dimensional, but also ach achieve an even precise connection of things between the virtual and the real, which will bring about a historical transformation to industries and to our daily life. At present, Sweden, Finland, and other countries all have competitive advantages in the construction of 5G networks. Latvia could make the best decision with the best combination of solution, um, maybe from Nokia, Ericsson, Samsung, and Huawei, and provide the best communication technology services with the lowest cost for the local customers and possible to take the role, maybe leading role in the construction and pilot trials of 5G networks in the Baltic countries. That's my idea. Um, I wish Latvia will take uh, its important roles and give full play to its advantages in the cooperation with China and the Nordic countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I believe we have had four very different speakers with different opinions, but let us just devise one conclusion on what they all I would assume agree on, and then we will open the floor to questions. And I believe that all of you would agree to an extent that there is benefit to be obtained from cooperation within the Belt and Road in Europe, existing, using both existing and new infrastructure, but there are also risks involved, and we should be aware of them. The EU has the capacity to shape BRI. I think this is a very important conclusion that Tim made. And the Baltics should capitalize on this capacity simultaneously strengthening our Scandinavian links. Thank you, and now please, the floor is open. I am a Japanese ambassador to here, Mr. Kawaguchi. Uh, this Today's topic is very important uh, to, to the Latvian peoples and Chinese people and uh, Japan as well. I think it is interesting. Thank you very much for the discussion. Uh, among the, there are some important words here. I, hear. I heard some, uh, my colleagues in China said, mentioned the international standards and then the team mentioned that some skepticism, but uh, for me, important word is sustainability. And also, uh, the format is one plus 17 is famous, but one plus 28 is more important. I know that, uh, I think no one mentioned that paper that the EU already published, the EU strategy on connecting Europe and Asia. That is an important document. Everyone in, the, in this room should read. I think uh, the starting, our discussion is uh, still initial stage, so we should start on the principle, first of all. Uh, some merit and uh, skepticism, but we should start on the, uh, on the some standards or principle. In that case, uh, physical connectivity uh, needs some s sustainability. Of course, from environmental point or uh, finance point and then social point, uh, the sustainability is, I think, important. And then also format 28 plus 1 is important. Uh, from a Japanese point of view, we start Japan, EU, SPA. So uh, we discuss with European Union and the, for all of the member states are also 
the, mem uh, the, the, the uh, partner of Japan EU strategic partners agreement. So Japan is now in the stage of starting, discussing uh, the, from our point of view the how to connect and increase in connecting the Japan and uh, so, sorry Asia and uh, Europe. Everyone agree that I think increase there is a need to increase the uh, connectivity Europe and Asia. So what uh, let's discuss from various points of view. And addressed to Mr. Sun or to any of the speakers, the, the discussion that you would like to have or Please colleagues, any volunteers? This is a very interesting point and connectivity indeed, uh, excuse me, sustainability indeed was one of the buzzwords that we did not hear today. So please, Professor. Well, um, uh, first, uh, maybe I would like to again respond to your uh, support to this idea of 28 plus 1. Uh, I have read, of course, the strategies, a new strategy of the which has been which is available. Uh, but the problem is that uh, strategy is still good uh, will to do something in the future, and in order to come uh, to implementation of this strategy. Uh, it is still a long way to go. Uh, given the new parliament, the new commission, so now at least we have to wait a little bit uh, before these potential uh, ideas which has been um, uh, put on the paper will be at least partly implemented. But I very much hope, that I, I fully agree that it's better to have 28 plus 1 than a uh, mixture of countries with individual interests uh, and maybe sometimes these interests are only, only partly, you know, uh, corresponds to the EU uh, general view. Well, it's non-consistent. It, I, I think it's good for for some time, but it's not. You talked about the sustainability. It's not sustainable. I think that this framework is temporary tem framework, which should be reconsidered in the future. It's my personal view. Uh, now, talking about environmental consideration, well, after uh, I will not be regional if I will uh, remind you that the U.S. now changed. I mean. Uh, I mean, U U.S. is out of the Paris Agreement, and China, on the contrary, is in, and uh, and agreed with the European Union that this is important and should be implemented. Okay, so in these uh, terms, the partnership between EU and China is extremely important under given cir circumstances. So uh, this is my short response. I think as is generally recognized in China, and, and certainly uh, commented on outside of China, uh, that the Chinese economy is slowing down. That is not, not going to reach, you know, 10% uh, GDP as it did a few years ago. It's, 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 it's coming down, and even the IMF has projected in 2020 that the GDP will be 6.1. Uh, and then there's, the, I think, an internal debate within China as to whether the money that is leaving t uh, for doing all sorts of projects around the world, including uh, Europe, uh, should be uh, used that way. So there's, there's an internal debate in China about the, the, the usefulness of, of, of this project. Um, and I guess my question is, uh, is, is there a possibility uh, that the intensity with which China has uh, developed uh, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative as, as it, in, in Europe will slow down and, and that it will be far more choosy, uh, more, uh, give more priority to certain sectors of the uh, European economy as opposed to uh, the way it was before where uh, Chinese investment uh, or mergers and acquisitions went in every direction possible. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, 
Uh, you are right. Uh, the Chinese economy is a little bit slowing down to uh, uh, um, 6.1 to 6.5 percent, not as fast as 10 percent uh, as years ago. Uh, it is because uh, China has uh, already developed uh, in a relatively large basis. Uh, I think it's normal. It's, uh, it's, uh, we call it the new normal. Yeah. Uh, even in this condition, I don't think the uh, Belton Road initiative will stop, will pause. But I think China uh, will pay more attention to some high quality project. We pay more attention to uh, environmental protection and uh, more green technology will be used. Um, I uh, in this background, uh, maybe uh, as uh, the World Bank and the IMF warning, uh, the global recession is coming and there's this threat. In this situation, I think uh, the Belt and Road Initiative could not stop. It could progress even maybe more stable and um, maybe faster. Yeah, that's my answer. Yeah, there's a bunch of points. Maybe I start with the last one because I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, the new normal, I think it points to two interesting aspects. I, I do think that you're right in saying uh, the Belt and Road might slow a bit. We might see a bit of a change in the Belt and Road. But um, I also agree, I don't think that it's going to, s to, to completely pause or, or being abandoned for several reasons. But it might not be uh, bad news for the Belt and Road, not for China, and also not for Europe. Because if you have lots of money, uh, you will spend also lots of money on uh, projects that might be less profitable, that you have thought about uh, less carefully. And if there's uh, fewer money, then you are um, forced. And this is nothing special about China. The same would be in Europe or anywhere around the world you're forced to make uh, harder choices. So actually, it, it may turn out that uh, the new normal will improve uh, the Belt and Road. Um, but we should also bear in mind, I think, and that's what I briefly referenced um, uh, in my opening statement, that the Belt and Road has always been to a significant extent about developing China. So the Belt and Road, uh, I think, has been uh, from the outset if if the Chinese leadership is good in one thing, then in uh, analyzing a situation uh, very proactively, so the Chinese have seen the new normal coming for a long time, and uh, the Chinese leadership has said, well, we have to find ways to address that, and the Belt and Road was one among several uh, uh, initiatives to actually help stabilize the uh, Chinese economy uh, on a certain uh, on a certain level. Um, so if the new normal, the, the new normal in itself is both a motivation for the BRI but a fewer funds may make it um, better. Let me pick up two, three points briefly that have been mentioned before um, and maybe to also to spice up the discussion a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I'm also sympathetic in to some extent to 28 plus 1. I think I would like to see it more as a 28 plus 1 plus the European Council to ma make it something really uh, a e an EU format. Uh, and I also think this is not directed against China or anything. I think that's really more something that Europeans need to be aware about. We are entering a stage where we have increasing rivalries on a number of issues, including high technology between the United States and China. And if European countries believe that they can tackle that all by themselves, and I think that's something I don't need to say in Latvia out loud. It's something that has to be emphasized in France and in Germany and in bigger countries that tend to think uh, we can do it ourselves. But um, that's not going to work for any European country. So what we need is actually, and I think the EU is actually uh, uh, progressing uh, into that direction, so there's positive steps taken, more coordination, finding more of a common position, and to add that, I don't think it's just uh, coordinating and cooperating within Europe, but also with international partners. And that, I think, particularly since we uh, share 
a wide variety of uh, economic and political principles with Japan. I think that Japan will be also one of the uh, uh, important partners to coordinate with. And um, very briefly, connectivity strategy, uh, glad you mentioned it. Uh, the main problem, I think, is that there's no budget attached to the connectivity strategy yet. So it's a nice document, uh, excellent, everything, but I think you've said it. It needs to materialize in the future, and we wait for the budget. And then we can talk whether that's uh, something substantial or not. And at the very end, um, international standards have been mentioned by you in the context of 5G. Uh, and I think uh, here it's very interesting because we have we are seeing all these rising tensions over the tech rivalry over Huawei between mainly the US uh, 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 and, uh, and China on the other side and Europeans trying to find their way to a common position here, some sort of middle ground. But when we look at the technological development of technical standards of uh, 5G, um, 5G is actually a rare example or, or an outstanding example of cooperation between Chinese tech giants uh, like Huawei, but also CTE, also others, uh, and Western firms, and also first and foremost Nordic ones, uh, and, you've met and you've named uh, the two most important of them, Ericsson and Nokia. They are competitors, yes, of course. They are competing companies uh, in a field, true. But you we can see that uh, they also have a common interest in a global 5G standard, and they've worked hard uh, to accomplish that, uh, and uh, when um, you have said that uh, China has achieved more than 30 percent of uh, standard essential patents, the same goes for Europe. So we can see there is actual competition. There's a share of the pie, and maybe that's uh, also a positive sign for economic cooperation, particularly on standards. It's not sustainability standards in that sense. It's it's more narrowly technical standards. Nonetheless, it might be a good good sign, a good example. Questions are coming. Um, I would like to quickly grab on to uh, Tim here. So, um, for example, once we start with the addition, it never stops, 28 plus 1, um, and so on and so forth. My question is, what do we do with the five Balkan states that are currently in the framework of 17 plus 1? And according to this addition, they would be left out, out of this. Are they on their own, or are we going further... 28 plus 5 plus 1 plus the commission. And another question quickly, to bring it back to the Scandinavian direction for the Baltic states. We heard Edgar's arguments in favor of it and the desperate need that we need to exercise this direction. What are your thoughts? Thank you. Um, on the first question, I think I would also like to hear your thoughts. Um, uh, let, let me say one thing in general. I mean, I've... I've referenced uh, 17 plus 1 before uh, uh, as being seen critical in Brussels. Um, I would add two aspects to it. First, I think 17 plus 1 has also been a vehicle, and that should be probably uh, recognized more in Brussels and elsewhere in Europe. Uh, it has been a vehicle to uh, increase Chinese awareness uh, of uh, Central and Eastern Europe. So it has served uh, also um, European interests and the EU should not be about Western Europe only but also about Central and Eastern Europe. Um, secondly, um, these are my, my personal thoughts here. Uh, secondly, I think while we uh, hear criticism about 17 plus 1 in Brussels, what we don't hear is criticism of bilateral relations of between Germany and China or France and China. Uh, but they leave out, by definition, 27 uh, other European uh, member states. So I don't subscribe to this narrative that uh, a format like 17 plus 1 or any sub-EU uh, that includes bilateral relations with China need necessarily to be, bu to be abundant. Um, what I think is what we need is strong European coordination. Also in, in, also in formats like 17 plus 1, you can meet before, you can coordinate. Uh, Euro again, Europe is moving into that direction. It's a positive sign, but I think what is important is that Europeans speak with one voice in a multitude of formats. So I'm not saying abandon uh, 17 plus 1. Whether there can be 
non-EU member states in a 28 plus one uh, summit. I don't know if if that's um, if there's topics on the agenda that make that uh, that render that uh, fruitful. Why not? Uh, we have international institutions with observer with countries that have observer status. Maybe something similar is possibly uh, possible here. Um, I think what is really crucial, I guess, the 28 plus 28 uh, plus one sends a signal that is more important within Europe. Uh, it would be one of several steps towards a more coordinated European position. I think it's really less about China. Um, the second question was uh, connectivity of uh, Latvia with uh, Nordic countries. Um, I, I don't know whether I have much to say about this. I mean, I, I, I'm always in favor, uh, wh wherever it's economically viable, to have an uh, uh, increase of connectivity, interconnectedness, uh, trade, uh, why not? Then we have to, of course, look into who is going to finance that, uh, um, uh, what are sustainability criteria, what are security criteria, but in general, uh, I have no objections. Why should I? Uh, you have uh, uh, you said a lot. That's why I wouldn't like to, to repeat what you already said. But Una asked about what to do with the Balkan countries. Look, um, if there are accession countries, then generally this framework 28 plus one can be also extended because uh, accession countries generally should apply with uh, European rules. So I think that it is not a problem. Uh, a second thing, you mentioned the European Council, but usually in the formats when all member states are taking part, there is also always uh, European Union presented either by the European Commission or by, no, usually by the European Commission, but it does, doesn't matter. I mean, and as to 28 plus one, if we are having, if having in mind that um, United Kingdom is about to leave, so maybe it's exactly 27 plus European Union. So this is my interpretation. Otherwise, I fully agree that uh, for Europe, it's extremely important to speak in one voice, yeah, and to increase coordination. Because when you are in a different format, like 17 plus one, you can, you just have certain constraint. Having in mind that, yeah, you are a member of the European Union, but it's not a real carnation. So that's why, as I said, this framework is not really sustainable. But there can be different, different formats of cooperation, right? Okay, and as to your second question about connectivity between Scandinavia, it's already in place. I mean, we have so many uh, trade relations, investment relations, uh, formats of cooperation, and so on and so forth. Asia, Europe. Format um, in the context of Asia Europe connectivity. Yeah, but I think that um, we just should build on already existing uh, linkages and trying not to compete too much because there are competing also things like ports, you know, even in the Baltic countries, uh, we can compete in Latvia with Lithuania, uh, with Klaipeda, okay, but of course we can also, within the Baltic Sea region, we also have a lot of competitors, not only in Scandinavian countries, but also in Germany, okay, and so, so it's uh, always about competition, but also trying to, and to find uh, benefits, um, uh, common benefits and uh, partnership. Belarus, uh, Oleg Shluma. Uh, just as a follow-up to uh, previous remarks on possible um, expansion of format of cooperation, uh, we in Belarus uh, propose an idea of uh, finding synergies between different already existing integration uh, formats uh, like uh, the European Union, uh, the Eurasian uh, European Union, uh, and China. So uh, uh, this is something which is already in place uh, these integration projects, and uh, we, I think, we could uh, try to find some synergies mm, uh, in order to avoid the situation when each individual country has to, you know, uh, find ways to um, uh, resolve certain uh, st problems and standards in uh, technology and so on. Just to speak with one voice on the side of European Union, Eurasian Economic Union, and China. 
uh, that might you know, facilitate you know the, this cooperation. Uh, and uh, plus, we cannot avoid talking with Russia, uh, Kazakhstan as members of the Eurasian Economic Union because they provide territory for Bell and Road. Uh, so in any case, all the routes will go through Russia or Kazakhstan. Uh, maybe including Belarus, and in this uh, sense, I'd like to remind that in Belarus, we have a very huge uh, project implemented with uh, participation of China, Great Stone Park, Industrial Park, and that could be a very important uh, mm, a part of this Bell and Road Initiative, a Bell and Road route uh, from China to, uh, through Latvia or through Baltic countries uh, to Scandinavia and to Europe at large. So that's why we have to think about existing possibilities, uh, which could be used more wisely and more effectively uh, to uh, facilitate cooperation and to promote uh, you know, the, the synergies, uh, just to, to, to come up with some concrete, uh, concrete uh, ideas and projects. Thank you. Do you have anything to add to the Belarus direction? Uh, yeah, I will try to be uh, laconic in as much as I can. So representing port or at this um, event, even the, the whole transport sector, I would say that uh, let the policy makers do their work and, and think about uh, bigger picture and, and in what format should we work? Is it 17 plus one or 28 plus one? Doesn't matter. Uh, for, for ports, for transport, uh, Belt and Road Initiative, um, we, we regard it as additional opportunity. Uh, of course, it's no secret that Ports are around for, 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 for many, many years, and they mostly uh, service uh, maritime trade. So we're talking about uh, cargo traffic that is coming by deep sea, uh, deep sea routes, uh, either directly already, uh, for example, through Port of Klaipeda, uh, or through feeder traffic from Central Europe, so from Far East. But uh, we definitely monitor the situation, what is going on, and we think uh, that um, uh, Latvian transport policy makers should really support China's initiative in as much as we can and um, it should be a common sense uh, to, uh, to grab on this uh, possible opportunity. What regards Belarus, I mentioned this already in, in my introductory uh, comments that uh, for the next 10 years we see this as a, a new potential strategic partner for Latvia, uh, mainly due to reasons that historically has proven that with our biggest neighbor it's very unpredictable um, you can not have either very good relationship or very bad relationship at some extent and not always the the, the actual effect of uh, for example decreasing cargo throughput is a direct output of your strategic decisions in terms of you know um, uh, making some 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 decisions as to what kind of infrastructure to do, and uh, this is more um, this more has to do with uh, uh, geopolitical uh, decisions that are out of our scope of reach. But um, we are looking at Belarus. Um, uh, we try to establish uh, better both uh, political relationship, uh, to at least uh, try to promote that our um, foreign policy makers should also not neglect uh, issues like transport because it's still transport and services account for some uh, slightly less than 10% of country's GDP. Uh, given that in the industry uh, many people are employed and it's a lot of assets, uh, it really should be uh, thought about. And uh, yeah, the example of uh, Great Stone that has been carried out uh, already uh, near Minsk uh, and the connections to um, connections by road and rail to uh, Latvian ports uh, should be used as an opportunity and uh, even further uh, if we talk about connectivity with Scandinavia we have uh, container lines we have uh, Roro ferries and so, so yeah just uh, try to build on this opportunity, but really um, support China's initiative uh, in as much as we can. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think very interesting insights. Uh, I would, uh, I would, perhaps a little bit continue already the previous uh, question and, and so the previous discussion. Vilgers mentioned a uh, big neighbor. Uh, 
and also being sort of quite unpredictable in many ways. But at the same time, we realize that so far the big neighbor, Russia, has been very indispensable in terms of transportation, be it in terms of uh, supplies, be it also in terms of the transit space. I mean, if we speak about Belt and Road, uh, we can say certainly it would not be marriage in heaven, but perhaps we still need marriage in, of convenience to also sort of to ensure that Belt and Road comes to Latvia. So my question would be a little bit, I, I hope so, a little bit with small, um, a small element of provocation. If we discuss the role of Latvia, if we discuss uh, the prospects of Latvia, is Scandinavian direction, is transcontinental connectivity actually sustainable without Russia? Well, uh, in my view, uh, China, Russia, U.S. and EU are global players. I mean, Latvia and even Scandinavian countries are part of this. Uh, they are small parts, especially Baltic countries, Scandinavian big, bigger. But anyhow, we are part of this global gain and global chain. And that's why I think we should take into consideration uh, the Russian uh, the Russian role in um, in political and economic uh, partnership with China, uh, which either is in line with what Europe want or not. I mean, but it's impossible to ignore neither Russia nor Belarus actually in uh, uh, in uh, assessment uh, our strategy and our uh, goal to be achieved. I don't want to make a case against Russia, but I want to uh, say if if we look at uh, the uh, trade facilitation and connectivity facilitation through the Belt and Road, uh, there's so much outside Russia that one could also read it as uh, sort of building a pillar that makes Europe less dependent on, on Russian trade routes. Uh, both maritime as well. I mean, there has always been trade between Asia and Europe that does not run through Russia, so don't get me wrong. So it's, it's not a paradigm shift here, but uh, I, I don't see that like, if things go, go badly wrong in, in Russia, I don't think that would substantially undermine the Belt and Road and, and cooperation between Europe and, and China. I, 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 don't, I don't see it. What I rather see as a sort of geopolitical threat uh, or I don't know whether threat is the right term but at least uh, a challenge uh, to us here is growing tensions between the US and, and China and where to situate Europe uh, in a constructive way that that's for me more an issue and that could I think more be uh, the end to, to uh, cooperation if we sort of play along a very Trumpist line here. Yeah, I would um, say that I didn't see much of a uh, provocation in your question, I think, because the answer lies already in it. Uh, of course, um, Russia is to be regarded as a partner at the same time, at least as far as Belt and Road Initiative is concerned. And by no means uh, should we re regard Russia as, as, as enemy, for God's sake, of course. Uh, uh, Latvian whole transport system, port uh, port operation, uh, uh, at least for, for the past, let's say, 15, uh, 20 years, uh, has really lived on that. Uh, yeah. I might be uh, maybe a little bit wrong with figures, but about 80% of traffic is transit, originating exactly from Russia. But we should not disregard what I mean to say, uh, disregard its its own transport policy and strategy of uh, building up its ports, uh, both uh, on the eastern shore of the Baltic Sea, so that are in the Gulf of Finland, and uh, more notably the, the, the um, changing um, flow of goods, changing patterns of goods, because, um, well, Russia's main export commodity is energy still. And um, in view of Europe's um, uh, policy with regard to CO2 emissions and so uh, we we have s received some insights uh, from external consultants um, um, 
for example, Port of Rotterdam International, the drafted Riga's uh, Freeport development program, that there is a high chance that uh, within next decade, even further on, Europe will be buying less of Russia's energy. So this flow that hitherto has been passing through the Baltic ports, both Baltic states and also Russian ports on the eastern shore of Baltic, will be um, digressed to other directions, like uh, Russian ports in the Far East, for example. So we're not talking only about us losing this cargo, but we're talking about this cargo, for example, leaving the region altogether. Uh, if we are talking about the uh, connectivity Belgian road, we cannot uh, jump over Russia. It's uh, one of the most <laughs> one of the most important chains in, in this uh, initiative. Um, just now, uh, Mr. Sh uh, Suna talked about the importance of uh, Russia for the port, the trade with port, the, the transit. Um, I think s s sometimes some. Uh, Flexible policy, some smart policy should be recommended if it will bring benefits to the local people, to the region. Why not? My name is Norman Grostinc. I'm chairman of the board of Latvian Institute of Future Studies. And uh, uh, we are here in Riga, actually. Uh, we are having this uh, outstanding uh, discussion in the context, uh, let's say, of uh, historic context and geopolitical context, which is very mm, vibrant, and sometimes um, is hunt the past is uh, hunting our very new country uh, quite seriously. Like, for example, uh, we can refer to sometimes uh, serious things, sometimes more ironic, because, for example, Riga has been, uh, uh, it may be interesting for our foreign guests, Riga has been the uh, largest city of Swedish kingdom until early 18th century. And uh, as a result, uh, it ended up with uh, iron chain in over the central river, uh, not allowing to resupply Riga from the sea uh, during the Great Northern War. And uh, quite recently, during the uh, Petersburg, in Pet St. Petersburg, during the economic forum, someone from Swedish embassy asked someone from Russian government to return Riga back to Sweden. So it was kind of a small diplomatic scandal. We can look at this at, uh, with irony. But um, if we look at more serious uh, developments uh, in our area, uh, let's uh, remember uh, that um, free ports and uh, free economic zones in Latvia started in, 90, uh, in mid 90s. Actually, uh, my institute at that time, uh, we were working more towards economics in the uh, Institute of Economic Reform. I'm proud uh, to be a person which uh, actually suggested to establish free ports and free economic zones in, uh, in Latvia in 1994. And uh, then uh, uh, the legislation was made until um, 1997. It was quite quite fast process because at that time we were uh, making decisions uh, what will happen in Riga and in Latvia. We were making the decisions uh, just in Riga, not in Brussels or whatever. Yeah, and uh, the most uh, since that, of course, I keep a on uh, how free ports and, and uh, all the transit uh, issues are developing, and because of that, I would like uh, uh, to be, uh, let's say, more laconic um, and not to make a big, big speech, like um, above mentioned uh, today, Prime Minister, who was uh, speaking very long uh, speech before nearly empty, huge room of European Parliament. I will not follow this example and be uh, quite laconic and ask uh, Mr. Suna, uh, what is your impression about uh, European Union legis leg legislation and regulations uh, concerning uh, free ports and uh, free economic zones in Latvia? At the moment, is uh, Brussels uh, helping us or is it um, kind of over-regulating and uh, kind of closing down the free ports and, and so? Thank you. We're very, already very out short. of time. Thank yes, you. Uh, thank you very much for, for challenging question. I get the last chance to, to, to say something. Um, yeah, uh, two things I want to mention. First is, uh, uh, from one side, I see uh, Brussels' um, uh, position towards Latvians, uh, Latvian ports as forthcoming because we, we have been able, uh, as, a, as a part of transitional agreement, um, 
to extend this free port status within the ports up to year 2035. From this uh, perspective, I, I see it as, as a great opportunity because we still uh, can try to build, attract more in for foreign local investment in port infrastructure because these, these incentives, tax reliefs, uh, kind of support uh, attraction of investment. From the other side, uh, very recently Europe passed uh, uh, directive on uh, port services that, that kind of tries, tries to regulate and, and, and tell us uh, what services should, could be and should not be provided by port authorities. Uh, to some extent we see it uh, as, a, as a really uh, kind of a hurdle in, in, in our daily operations. So yeah, it's very mixed. And thank you very much for being here today. I believe that we have some takeaways from, from our today's uh, meeting, but one of them is that we might all be slowing down in our growth, but it leads to more responsible choices. Thank you very much. Please applaud to our speakers today. Thank you.